Hello, uh, I'm Tony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout. And welcome to episode four of the Useless Podcast. Tony, what are we talking about today? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff. You guys gave us a lot of good questions. Let's see. You know what? You know what the one I want to talk about? In the spirit, before we get to answering questions, let's talk about feedback. Feedback. And how we take feedback. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, and do, it's you, just, do you take feedback, Tony? I thought you didn't take feedback. Uh, well, I, I have my own personal demons with this whole, <laughs> with the whole idea of fan feedback. Uh, I believe one of the questions specifically was, how do we handle when the game gets received poorly? And there was another question that's only semi-related was, how do we corral fan feedback when we're looking to maybe make a sequel or do something like that? Right. What are the, what are the avenues that we take? Yeah. How does, it, how does it get to us? What do we do with it? And um, I mean, I think a lot of that is the, industri- the industry's relationship with game reviewers can be touchy. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. A lot of people have a lot of different uh, opinions about how much stock you should put into reviews, and and there's, I mean, there's a lot of people who have a lot of different opinions, and it's hard to find one monolith consensus as to how much stock you should put into game reviews. Game reviews are only one of the many ways, though, that that feedback from fans can get to us. I mean, it used to be the only way, though. Right. Because before the comment sections on websites, we could never get fan review, and oh god, comment sections. We could do a whole podcast on comment yeah. sections. But uh, uh, the only way was through, you know, we'd read the reviews, we'd find out what they didn't like, and we'd try to do it better next time. But now, with YouTube and forums and Twitter and everything... A lot of people think that if you post on some obscure internet forum about a game, that nobody's going to see it. But when you work in a creative industry, and when something that you've worked on for years finally gets out there... There is no discussion forum about your work that's too insignificant for you to go and seek it out. If it shows up on Google, then you're going to find it. Right. Because you look at everything. I mean, I just thought that was just me. I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> I've been known to troll obscure internet forums. Oh, yeah. Nothing. From time to time. If just... it doesn't require a login, I'm there. Yeah. yeah. I'll read anything. I'll read threads and threads and threads about it. Or at yeah. least I used to. I don't do that as much anymore. Yeah. I mean... I've... I've discovered that that's just a path to heartbreak for the most part. It's not really how you get honest, heartfelt feedback from somebody. Right. It's more like you learn about how your game blows. Right. Which is, they're two different things. I mean, that's the thing. A lot of of places, I mean, you see this a lot on the WoW forums, uh, famously, is people are always like crying out for a Blizzard response on their thread, thinking that if it it doesn't get a response, it wasn't read. Oh, they read it. Yeah. They just didn't respond to it. They've read it. There were a bunch of conversations about it at lunch. There might have been a meeting generated because of it. Yeah. But you will never hear about that. Right, exactly. Yeah. They read... I read a lot about what people think about my games. I just don't post about it. Because what can be gained from getting into an internet fight about my stuff? I mean, we've seen lots of examples, actually, in the last few months about developers who get into it on the internet and how that just never works out. Well <laughs> right, exactly. They just get owned by it. So, uh, um, I mean, so the thing about fan feedback is, yeah, I Google search the game. I look for everything that I can take in, and I just read about what people are saying, what they like, what they don't like. And I, I mean, it all goes in. What's actually, you know, what actually causes me to think about and change? I mean, that's a little bit different. But I definitely have read a lot there isn't like a official channel that fan feedback goes through. Right. I've never seen that. It's generally just a individual developer will notice something written somewhere. And then at the next meeting, talking about that feature for the sequel, they'll be like, hey, D's Nuts 475 had a real problem with that. Do D's we Nuts really 475 that... has a problem with a lot. Fuck that guy. He's always yeah. complaining, D's Nuts. Yeah. If you hear us talking about D's Nuts, you know we're talking about that asshole. Actually, that asshole is a completely different <laughs> internet problem. Personally, my favorite way to, to get fan feedback now, like I used to uh, I used to read all of the reviews, every single review, and then every review that came in under what I thought the game deserved would just kick me in the nuts heart-wise. <laughs> so I, I had to stop that. But now what I do is I'll watch Let's Plays uh, of people playing my game. And it's like a getting a free focus test. Like a... Uh, uh, you get to see them failing. It's better than a focus test because at a focus test, they're not mumbling to themselves constantly about what, <laughs> everything that they're doing, right? 
Like you, you watch a Let's Player and he's like, I wonder what's over here. What if I double click on this thing? What if I do this? And they're just telling you all these remarkably useful things about what's going on in their mind. The other reason I like Let's Players is because it makes me feel like God, right? Like I get to watch the game and I know all of the thousands of sneaky little things I put in to make them do exactly what I want them to do but not know that I'm doing it. Yeah. And then they do them all. And I feel like a puppet master pulling their strings. So it's it's a double double kick there. Yeah, I mean and the the funny thing about the Let's Plays is like even like obscure Let's Players. Like I've seen some video, I've seen some video playthroughs of games that I've worked on. That have had like a hundred views. Or less, yeah. Yeah, but I watch them. I'll sit there and watch them. Like there is no, there is no level of obscurity that you're going to fly by under the radar. Like there's always a chance that a developer is going to stumble upon your video and watch it. So chances are, if you say something about a game, the developers heard about it. Yeah. That's just sort of what the internet does. Yeah. We're all vain people. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't be in a creative industry if we weren't really interested in the result of our creative process. Right. So, like, finding fan feedback isn't the hard part. No. We're inundated with that stuff. I think the hard part is probably sorting through and figuring out, A, what what is the high-priority stuff? What is the biggest bang for your buck? And, B, what, to, what how much do the players even know what they want? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's not that they don't... Like, they want to have fun, right? Or they want to experience the game in a certain way. And they know that. But what they might not know is why they're not having fun. Mm-hmm. Right? They may think it's one thing. When, when you look at it as a game maker, it's completely a, a different thing. You know, They may think, uh, man, this game sucks because it's just too hard. right? And you're like, well, it's too hard because the, enemy's AI, or the, 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 the player's companion's AI was broken. Right? And you're like... You know why it is. Right. They might have a thousand reasons why they think it's too hard. Like, oh, you need to do this and this and this. But no, if you fix that one little problem with the AI, it might fix the whole thing. Right. Yeah. So often you don't have to make a thousand changes when one changes will fix the problem. And knowing when that, knowing what the difference is between those is the difference between a senior game maker and a junior game maker. Right. I mean, that's and that's the other thing is, uh, that's I mean, we talked about it in the first episode that there's a whole category of things that people don't understand about making games from an amateur perspective. Uh, When you're an outsider looking in, you kind of, you can take guesses as to how to fix things. But until you're in there and you actually see what's going on. Like, and that's the, that's the thing I see all the time. Uh, When people talk about bugs and then you see people talking about a bug and then there's always somebody in the comments who says, this has only got to be like two lines of code. You don't know. (laughs) You don't know. I'm a programmer, and I would never dare say that about somebody's bug. Because I don't know. I don't know their systems. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's causing the bug. Uh, something that seems simple from the outside, you, I mean, it could be tied in so deep into that system that fixing it is just a disaster. Right, because at some point you'll touch multiple features and then break a thousand more things. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. Like, in one game that I was working on, we had a bug where sometimes when you were swimming if you were sort of not if you were just sort of tapping a little bit on the analog stick the character would slowly just phase through walls and that's obviously bad yeah like you can't phase through walls no but you look at it like oh well just okay just make them not go through walls how hard can it be to not go through walls two lines of codes top easy yeah. easy how i mean it's a wall just don't go through the wall that's how I, but the thing that was making them go through walls was deep Deep, deep, deep in the core physics system. Yeah. Is what was causing them to go through walls. Oh, shit. And, and the so, physics system touches everything. Yep. And so the question was really, okay, do I make this change in the deep, deep, deep part of the physics system one month away from ship? Or do we go crazy and try to find some other solution? And we, basically, we were just trying to find something that didn't involve changing the, the physics, physics system. system, yeah, right. because what did you end up doing? Uh, I basically you can uh, basically I found out that if you put like four walls like in a row, eventually you'll just be checking so much that eventually it'll catch something, and it'll go through. So I was like, "Fuck it, huge walls," because <laughs> they were just like these little planes. And I was like, "You know what? If we just make them huge, it works." So we just made found all the, the all the places and just made all the walls huge. 
It was a lot more work than the physics change, but had to be done. Less dangerous. Right, less yeah. dangerous. So even if the even if the change even if the bug that you're talking about is easy to fix, you might not want to make that easy fix because it's too dangerous. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So I mean thing is easy fixes are it's easy to say from the outside, oh that can't be hard. The armchair game developer says Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But you don't know. It's all and so that and that's a lot of the problem with getting feedback is so many people just think they know when they don't know. They don't know. And so you have to sort of develop that filter of what's meaningful feedback and what's not meaningful feedback. And I think that's a lot of the um, I think that's where a lot of people have problems with reviews. Is a lot of people look at reviewers as uh, more people who don't really understand what they're talking about. I've definitely seen some people sort of read a review and take it very personally and be like, oh, this person doesn't know what they're saying. They don't know blah, blah, blah. They don't know this. They don't know that. And it's, it's really easy to just fall into that trap when you read, when you hear feedback of just being like very dismissive yeah. of critical that, that feedback. That player's just stupid. We right. don't need to listen to them. And uh, that's the best way to make a shitty game. <laughs> the people who are my customers and who will buy my game and whose enjoyment is the entirety of what my livelihood depends on. Yeah, that guy's a fucking idiot. <laughs> I don't care whether he has fun. Like, it's just dumb. You don't make games that way. Right. Even though I should have learned a long time ago to not read internet comments, I still read internet comments. I do too. I just don't do it as much as I used to. Right. And I don't take it as personally as I used to. Right. But, I mean, it's... I've never had problem finding feedback on the things that I worked on. Yeah, it's there. There's no need for a system. I'm not living in a bubble of positive feedback on my <laughs> games. I think people think that that happens, that, right? That there's people living surrounded by yes men, and there's probably a couple, mm -hmm. right? And they're probably very high up in corporations and stuff. But most of the people making your games, they know how bad the game was, right? Like they're they're under no illusions that they made a great game most mm -hmm. of the time they're just like man we really fucked that up or man the circumstances were just so crazy we couldn't have done any better there was a story there's a story involving you at one of our first e3s oh yeah uh this is i mean this all comes back to rule number one and this is something i learned really early because we were at e3 and we were walking the floor at e3 and there was oh, this right i remember this. booth this huge booth huge screen and this trailer for a game played. And we sat there and we watched the trailer. It wasn't a good trailer. Yeah. It was some MMO. Yeah. It just didn't, didn't look, look good. Yeah. Didn't look very good. Uh, watched the trailer to the end. And I turned towards you. And I basically said, that looked like shit. Yeah. And we started I think that was a quote. Yeah. And then we walked away. And as we were walking away, some guy yells at us, hey, thanks for the feedback. And it's a guy basically in a shirt from the company yeah, who yeah. overheard me saying to you that his game looked like shit. Well, and then we noticed that we were wearing shirts for the companies we were. <laughs> exactly. For. And I was like, okay, somebody's always listening. You're not, you're never so obscure that somebody's not listening to what you say. Yeah. And it hurts. It does. It always hurts. Yeah. So all everybody that goes and rages on internet forums about the game or whatever... I'm sure. I'm sure there's a contingent of people who are going to be like so happy that you that some developer saw what you said and and that it hurt their feelings. and that it hurt their feelings. But I'm sure there's an equal number of people who will be like who will realize that somebody read that what yeah. you said. Yeah. And now you you're in a, on a list in their mind of people who just sort of talk shit on the internet. Yeah. Or. Like, you just hurt someone's feelings. Maybe that's not what you meant to do when you were yelling about how this game wasn't as fun as you hoped it was. Right. Maybe you could say, this game wasn't as fun as I hoped it was, as opposed <laughs> to whoever coded this system should die in a fire. Yeah. There's a different way of phrasing. Yeah. Feedback. Based on the questions that we got from our last episode about, uh, from the episode about difficulty tuning, dynamic difficulty tuning, and, and cheating in the player's favor... I think there were some points that we didn't make very clearly that I wanted to okay. you know, sort of circle back to. Um, one of them was uh, these systems also make the game harder if you're good at the game, right? So uh, it's not about everybody gets a medal, participation ribbon right. crap, right? It's about making the game the proper degree of hard given the player's skill level, right? Because someone who's right. good at the game doesn't want an easy game, 
and someone who's not good at the game doesn't want an impossible game. And what the systems are there for is to make that happen. Now, if you want to make a hard game, you can do that and still have dynamic difficulty tuning in it. It's not about That's making right. the game easy. You can have a game that is brutally fucking hard. And you put in dynamic difficulty tuning so that it stays brutally hard when people start getting better. Well, I mean, that's the the thing about the thing about it is uh, even on games that I work on, uh, there are people out there who play my games who are better at my games than I am. Many, I mean, I think people who watch the Ratchet podcast know that (laughs) that everybody is better at that game than I am. So when I'm sitting there playing the game, and when I'm sitting there sort of tuning the difficulty. The only metric that I have to tune the difficulty is how hard is it for me? Or for somebody to bring over to... Right, right, or to test. Chooch. Or Or for chooch. Or for chooch. For you or for chooch. But for the people that are really good, if I just had one difficulty setting that I tuned on my own, the people who are really good would not have a challenging game in that way. But when I have dynamic difficulty tuning, I'm also building in for people who are better than me to play the game. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to finish my own game. Right. And then there would be no game. Exactly. Yeah, it's not like you could do everything and then ratchet the difficulty up at the last second and hope it's beatable. Right, exactly. Right? Like, somebody has to be able to beat your game. And usually that's the testers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they end up being better than almost anybody. And when it's the testers, how could you even use that data? Exactly. Like, they've played the game literally thousands of times. They know what everything is before it's even going to happen. Like... They're more like speedrunners than they are players. Right. Right. So you can't even use that data. So it's a, it's a tool for making the game be as hard as you want it to be for everybody. Right. So wh- here's what you do. You go in and you tune the game the normal manual way. Right. You say, okay, Ratchet has 100 hit points. This monster does 10 damage. Right. And this monster does 20 damage. So now you know that monster A does half as much damage as monster B, and that monster A does about 10%, and monster B does about 20%, right? You can change those numbers around to make the game harder or easier, but you change them around so that monster B is still twice as hard as monster A, and right, so that the relationships between the difficulty things are the same, Mm -hmm. so that somebody else playing the game will have the same experience. That's all we want. We don't want everybody to just win. Right. That's not necessarily the thing. We do want everyone to get to the end of the game. That doesn't mean they need to get 100%. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they need to get to the end of the game on hard. It doesn't mean any number of... It doesn't mean they need to be able to get all the achievements. It doesn't mean... Fuck, it doesn't even necessarily mean they need to see the best ending. They just need to not be completely walled by your game at some point. Just they, They need to not run into a brick wall. Unless that's the point of your game. Right, like that that game you were telling me about, the uh, do not believe his lies or something. Oh right, like that. yeah, the puzzle game. The entire purpose of that game it's is to that block no one you. can solve it. Right. Yeah, it's to you know it was the same with I love bees. Right. As some games, that's what you want, and dynamic difficulty tuning is not going to help you in that case. So here's the here's the last word we'll probably say on dynamic difficulty tuning for a while until you can throw in your last words if you want. But the the system is it's not just about easy it's also about hard and making games hard like making a hard game dynamic difficulty tuning is a good tool for that also right yeah it's, it's not just everybody can beat this game you could also use it for no one can beat this game so just if you're a little open minded about the feature and you can put it in to a game you're making you can easily see how much better it is for the players, and you'll never want to do anything else again. Right. So. I mean, I just want... I, my addition is that even for people who uh, who are very good at games and want games that are, you know, made for, for them... Yeah. Um, I mean, that's even more reason to want things like dynamic difficulty tuning, because I'm not very good at a lot of these games. And if I was sort of designing games for me, they would not be hard for you. No. <laughs> exactly right so you should be happy dynamic difficulty tuning exists because that's the way that you can get hard games from people who don't right who can't play hard games yeah you know and I guess some people would say well good that they can't <laughs> but then you get to play less games so stop complaining about there not being enough games for you kind of to continue on a little bit segue a little segue is a lot of the thing about uh, fan feedback and reception and 
that, that ties a lot into difficulty and that ties into also a lot of a lot of working on a game you're just thinking forward to the next one to do all the things that you couldn't do in the game that you're working on that's the excuse I give myself to make it less painful to cut something that I love. Right. Oh, I'll just do it in the next game. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a catchphrase. Yeah, to the that point. Don't worry, it'll go in two. It'll yeah, we'll in, do it in the sequel. We'll do it in the sequel. Uh, sequels in games are way different than they are in other media because in movies, if you get a part two, chances are it's not going to be better than part one. For every Godfather and Godfather 2, there's a movie that had a great first one and just died in the second. Right. In games, that doesn't usually happen. If a game gets a sequel, the second game is usually way more fun than the first game. Well, the great thing about games is that when you're starting to work on the second one, you have a base that yes. wasn't there when you were working on the first one. You've solved a lot of problems already. You right. have code, you have assets, you have a lot of stuff that you didn't have. You have tools, you have an engine, you have just... Employees. Employees. People who, like... And just learning what works and what doesn't in the development of the first game. It's like, oh, this gameplay we thought was going to work, it didn't really work. This thing that we didn't work, that didn't work, it worked really well. It was amazing. You can kind of, like, uh, the thing with a sequel is it needs enough new stuff to... Be worthy of being a sequel, right? So it's not a ripoff. But it also needs to be familiar enough to the original premise that doesn't seem like a completely different game, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of that is taking what you learned from the first game that worked, making sure you have X amount of that in the game so that, you know, okay, we've got our bases covered. We're pretty safe. Let's start experimenting with these scary new features, right? So you'll know that even if everything went to hell, you'd still have the core from the first game that you could put more levels on. Right. right. So the whole process of making a sequel is just less, I'm uh, not less intensive because they're not easier. Right. Because you just do twice as much and it takes twice as long. You mm -hmm. know, like you just invent more work for a sequel. One of the games I point to the most when I talk about this sort of thing is Assassin's Creed. And I remember playing the first Assassin's Creed and liking it. Yeah, it was a good game. But I could tell when I was playing it that they didn't realize what the most fun part of their game was soon enough. Because the, the last hour of the game was all combat. And right. the fun part of Assassin's Creed 1 was running around. And, right. Yeah. And so I'm, they figured it out over the course of development, clearly. Yeah. But not soon enough to actually change the direction of that particular game. Right. It still had to end with the same ending. Right, right? exactly. They couldn't make an ending about you climbing shit. But on the second one... They had clearly figured out what the best part of their game was, and the game was so much better for it. And then they improved combat, and that made the rest of the game even better. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, that, that's the thing is... Uh, so Ratchet was like that, too. Ratchet was a lot like that, too. Yeah, in one, uh, no upgrades, no... There's a lot of really good player features that just weren't in that game, to the point where you can't go backwards. Mm -hmm. The thing is, sequels get such a bad rap of just like, oh, they're not trying... Oh, it must get really boring to have to make the same game over and over. But at the same time, like... That's th true if you're on number three or four. Right. Like, after three, it's hard. It gets hard. But before three, it's very exciting to work on a sequel. Yeah. I mean, every, the thing... when Every studio I've worked on, when they're working on the game, everybody's looking forward to the second game. Yeah. The second game even more than any other game after it. Because right. This, then you can put in the stuff you wanted to put in. Mm -hmm. You could undo your heartbreak. The third game has the potential of being a perfect realization of what you tried to do in the first game, which was what I felt like with Ratchet. The third game was kind of, that was what we were shooting for always, but we didn't know how to get there until we'd made three games. Right. And there's no other way to get experience in making a Ratchet game than to make a Ratchet game. That's right. And so I think that's, I, that's one of the things where I, I think a lot of people don't understand about, I mean, sequels just get a bad rap in general. In terms of like, oh, how hard can it be? It's hard. It's really, really hard. I mean, I just finished a, a challenge where I made a game in seven days. And I knew that was going to be brutally, retardedly hard. And it was at least ten times harder than I thought it would be. Uh, like, and when you're making a game that is as huge as games are and requires as many people as there are, it is a miracle that games get done to any degree of quality. But here's the thing, Mike. If you were to make a sequel to that seven day game in another seven day in another seven days, it would be so much better. So much better. 
It would be great. And, uh, and that's really our point, right? Is that while they get maligned, in video games at least, because of the way that they're made and because of the nature of the medium, the sequels are usually a good thing for the developer and for the, the crowd. Not always, right? When you get the cash-in sequels, mm-hmm. it happens. Or they switch developers and the second developer clearly had no idea what was fun about the game. Uh, that sort of stuff happens a lot. Or when it's clear that the people making the game didn't know what was fun about their game. Right. Right? That does happen too. Like, uh, I remember thinking that, and, and uh, what I just said was stronger than what I mean right now. Uh, when I was playing, remember uh, Burnout 3? Mm-hmm. Uh, where you, you uh, I think it was Revenge, Burnout Revenge. And it was, they had this cool mode where you could wreck the car and do all these stunts with it and everything. And then in the next game, they removed a ton of that. And that was my favorite thing. <laughs> I'm like, this is why this is more fun than Mario Kart or another racing game is because I can do all these crazy crashes. And you decided to make everything else. Yeah, it's yeah, it bugs me. That's all I'm saying. I, I see. But uh, uh, you know, it happens. Sometimes the person who knew the game the best left after the first game because you know. The, people it happens. leave right yeah, it, it happens. happens or uh, or sometimes you know uh, uh, you you finish the game and you think wow we got a lot of good reviews about this feature let's just fucking double down on this feature and then you know you don't see the rest of what made your game awesome right so maybe you double down on one feature but take out another feature that was making that feature work and all of a sudden crap Everything's screwed up. Mm-hmm. What, what's wrong? What's missing? And you have to go back to the drawing board. That is something also that can happen with sequels. But generally speaking, in my experience at least, the sequels are usually more fun to do than the first one. At least up to three. <laughs> after, after the third game, I want to kill myself rather than working on another game. So that's just me, though. I remember there was a conversation you had with Moo about grind rails. And how Moo was talking about... Uh, how we the grind rails were his favorite part of the Ratchet, Ratchet series. Love right. grind rails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanted to put more grind rails everywhere. Yep. And he was basically just like, why don't we do more grind rails? Just grind rails, grind rails, grind rails. And you're like, Moo, we've done everything there is we can do <laughs> with grind rails. There's nothing new to be done with grind rails. We can't just put grind rails everywhere because we've done it all. Well, and part of what's fun about a grind rail is that it's not happening all the time. Right. You have the people who are just like, We've taken this as far as it can go. But the, at the same time, there's always people who want to push it farther. Yeah, yeah. Like, for, all, for everybody who's like, okay, we're done with this, there's always somebody who's looking forward and being like, how can we keep pushing this? How can we keep doing something with this? And there's always going to be people like that who are always looking forward to the next game and trying to build on top of what you have. And that's why sequels are very exciting to work on is because you can just, you're building off of a solid foundation. Not only of the foundation you built on your game, but the foundation of all of the competition that was released along with you. Right. Right? Because you, you, like, they may have had different ideas of how to accomplish something, and their idea might have been ingenious. And you can find a way to take the nugget of that idea and express it through your game in a way that's unique. Right? But that solves a problem that you didn't necessarily know how to solve. Well, I mean, you just look at the MMO market, and you look at... Uh... Every MMO pre-World of Warcraft... Had the and, same problems. And every MMO post-World of Warcraft... Is World of Warcraft. Is World of Warcraft. Yeah. Everybody sees the game that fixed all the problems like, oh my god, this is, this is the foundation to build all MMOs on. Yeah, it becomes an industry standard. Halo did that with first-person shooter control. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden, every game has to use it, right? Call of Duty came along, and they had their little uh, take damage until you die system and then as soon as you take cover you heal and then you go back out or was that halo that was halo halo did that yeah, first. Halo. halo did that and then all of a sudden call of duty was doing it every game was doing it right uh it became the new industry standard the two weapon thing for a while that was such a brilliant solution to a problem with first person shooters which is that it's difficult to balance a game when you don't know what weapon the player is going to have and in halo they could only ever have two weapons and you usually know what those were And so you were able to design very, very clever setups that took advantage of specific weapons. Uh, Then everybody did it, but all of a sudden it didn't become as interesting But that's what's so funny is you can be epic and not make Halo, 
But now you're in a post-Halo world. Yes. And now your games are so much better for it. And your game, if you didn't do those things, would be judged against Halo, who is doing those things. Right. And so, just like a a game in a post-Gears of War universe was very different than a game in a pre-Gears of War universe. For example, you didn't have the active cover systems. Right. Those did not exist anywhere. I mean, maybe a few games were doing it, but Gears of War did it so well. They set the standard. That Absolutely. After that, every third-person game had to have a cover system in it. I mean, it's still happening. Like, it, it completely changed the third-person shooter market. Uh, I'm surprised the Ratchet games don't have cover systems at this point, because you would think... Uh, I mean, they have cover, but it's old-school cover. Right. Which is my favorite kind of cover. <laughs> Unreal Tournament style, baby. Unreal Tournament. I will kick anyone's ass in Unreal Tournament. That's old. No. Nobody plays that anymore. It has to be Unreal Tournament 2003, and I don't think you can run that. I don't think, yeah, I don't think that, I think you need to go get a copy of Windows 98. I recently, uh, I I got a game that I wanted to play from back when I was in high school. Okay. And it required Windows (laughs) 3.11. And I thought to myself, surely there's a way to play this in Windows 7. No, there is not. So I, uh, I, I don't think it. you can install Windows 3.11 without like a floppy disk drive, right? You can. Oh, really? You can. I, I, I downloaded DOSBox and installed Windows into DOSBox. Huh. Right? Because you, you, you can mount a directory a hard drive, on your hard drive. So I just installed Windows 3 and now I can play it in DOSBox. It's awesome. I have Windows 3 that I didn't even remember how to use that operating system. <laughs> I was like, Where's, where do you change the background? What's going on? I forgot. Like, oh man, that's, that operating system was awful. So bad. But uh, to bring it back around, Windows 3.1, right. it's, it's that with games, except for not Windows. Perfect. <laughs> profound right perfect summation of what we were talking about i i thought so so for developer commentary for this very special episode was it special i think it was i learned something about the human don't do drugs yes winners don't do drugs that's right just say no uh, yeah just say no uh also uh never start forest fires yeah oh don't start forest fires only you can prevent them that's right what did mcgruff the crime dog say uh, take a bite out of crime. Take a bite out take of crime. Take a bite out of crime. God, it's been so long from a good... Uh, so for this very special and socially conscious episode of the Useless Podcast, my name is Mike Stout. I'm Tony Garcia. And we'll catch you next time for another very special episode where we talk about something completely different. Yes, hopefully. So much of the, about the so much about sort of the the feedback and the difficulty is so much about and even the cuts is that